Well, William got a lollipop for that. And so we were very nervous. His mom was very nervous about how that was going to go. And you had told me that being a grandparent was good, but you didn't tell me how good it was. What a great, great thing to bring him up here. Well, today we are concluding our series, um, All Things New. It's been a series that I've looked forward to now for years. I love the book of Philippians. In fact, if you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 4. I love this book. And today we're going to be talking about how a relationship with Christ, as Paul winds up this letter to this church that he dearly loves, how a relationship with Christ will birth within us a new generosity. That as we allow Christ to shape our hearts and our minds that he also shapes our desires and our wants, and it's all to the glory of God. You know, as I was preparing for this, I I thought about how in recent weeks we collected all of those gift cards, we wrote all of those letters and notes and prayers to first responders and medical professionals uh, that had been on the front lines of COVID. This church was so generous in their response, and we've been getting lots of feedback from the people who were the recipients of your generosity. I wish I had the time to read a lot of these to you. I'm going to read just a portion of one, and that is from the chief of police here in University Park, Bill Mathis. He wrote a wonderful letter, and at the conclusion, he wrote these words, to know that the congregation of Park City's Baptist Church do pray for the men and women of the University Park Police Department is the greatest gift you could give to us. You know, we received lots of word back from medical professionals, uh, those people in the hospitals all across Dallas. And I could synthesize everything down to just a few sentences. You remembered. You remembered. You remembered us. We, we were thinking that no one has recognized the sacrifice that has been these last 20, 21 months as we've battled COVID, but you, you reminded us people care. A new generosity. And I can promise you this. Those little $5 gift cards or $10 cards that you purchase from Starbucks or for some other establishment, and those notes that you've written, they are going to bear fruit for months and years, and we trust for eternity because you were generous, a new generosity. So today, that's what we're going to be looking at, and we're going to look at how this generosity springs forth again from someone who has the attitude, the mind of Christ, and it helps us understand that God can use all of you, every aspect of your life, to his glory. So Philippians chapter 4, we're going to begin in verse 13. Now, if you take notes, and I hope you do, this is uh, the first point. Contentment is the catalyst of our generosity. Contentment is the catalyst of our generosity. In verse 13, Paul writes this, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I can do everything. You know, that is a positive, optimistic expression of faith, isn't it? I've got it underlined in my Bible. I have got it asterisk. That's a promise I want to remember. But now I want you to think about it. It doesn't mean what a positive thinking guru would tell you. I can't do everything. If I could, I'd be be Tom Brady. That's not going to happen with me. I can't do everything. You can't do everything. But what we can do is what God has purposed us to do as individuals. What does God want you to do in your life? As you open your heart and your mind to the will of God, what is it he's calling you to do? Well, he helps us understand the context if you go back to verse 10. So look with me in verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you've been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Paul is talking here about how as we open our hearts and minds to the Spirit of God, God calls us to a new purpose. And because of that, what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, he says here that he knows what it's like to be in times of plenty 
and in times of need, to be well-fed and to be hungry. He said, I've learned to be content. I've learned to be content, content in all the circumstances of my life. In fact, in verse 12, he says it this way, I've learned the secret. Now, that word secret's an interesting word. You don't see it anywhere else in the New Testament. There's imagery there to um, kind of a pagan initiation ritual. They would have been difficult. They would have been hard. What Paul is saying by using this word is that it has been hard work to get to the point that I can say, I'm content. I'm content. And because of that, what? I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. There's your context. You can do all that God has called you to do in life. And as I live my life according to the purposes of God, I'm leading a life that is going to be joyful, that's going to be reflective of the Spirit of God and what God has done for me. So early on in this series, our pastor challenged all of us to memorize Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Really, verses 1 through 11. I want you to look back with me. Just go back a couple of pages. You shouldn't have to because you've got it memorized, but we'll just look anyway, okay? Paul says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. What's the attitude of Jesus? He gave. He sacrificed. Now, if you grew up in church, you were in Sunday school, one of the very first, maybe the very first verse you would have learned is John 3.16. Say it with me. For God so loved the world, he gave. He gave. Yeah, he gave what? His one and only son. And so we see as we look at the attitude of Christ, it is an attitude of generosity. We are called to be people of generosity. Now, you may say, okay, Rodney, this is a Baptist church. I knew this was about money. That's where you're going. Go ahead, hit it. We'll get out quick. (laughs) That's not what I'm talking about. Is money part of it? Absolutely. Why? Because it's part of my life. But what Paul's talking about right here is your total life expression your total life. Let me give you an example. Last Thursday, I knew I was going to be bringing this message, so I had put on my calendar from early in the morning all the way to the evening that I was going to be in preparation. You know what time I finally got to pick up my Bible? Between 4 and 4.30. It's one of those days. You have those days Everybody needed me. Some unexpected meetings came in. They went long. I had some drop-ins. And, you know, with one of the drop-ins, I, I, I had the opportunity. I could have kind of just moved them out the door, but I didn't. I sat and I focused and I listened. You know what that is? That's generosity. You know why I did it? Because I'd been studying this passage. God calls us to a generosity of relationship. And a generous person will focus in on the individual and not look past them to the next need. I had lunch last week with a gentleman. I asked him about his business career. He began to talk about all that he had done, all he had been engaged in in life. And I was, I was amazed because all of a sudden something clicked in my mind and I thought, we're starting a ministry and this guy would be great. And you know what? I asked him. He got excited. I imagine he's in the room today. Although he heard I was preaching, he may be in the other room, but uh, he, he, he got excited. He called me a couple of days ago. He, he mentioned that he had talked to somebody else. They had mentioned the same thing about an individual we were talking about. He's excited about being part of it. Why? Because he has taken an approach to life that he has open hands and open heart. That's what Paul's saying there. Now, I told you, this grandparenting gig's pretty good. You get them when they're happy and they're excited and they're rested and you send them home when they're tired and they're cranky and you just go about your way. But if you're a grandparent, you can give parents a gift and you can give your grandkids a great gift. What? You focus on them, not with presence, but with your presence. Focusing in on listening to them. You may say, but my kids don't live here. Then be creative. 
find ways to make an eternal impact and investment in your kids. That's whole life generosity. Whole life generosity means you take that which is you, your giftedness, your talents, your vocational interests, your training, and you use it what? To the glory of God. But you open your heart to be able to do it. Now, I said that um, uh, contentment is the catalyst, right? It's the catalyst of generosity. Well, I don't remember much about high school chemistry, but I do remember this, that a catalyst in a chemical reaction changes the properties of both permanently. Well, spiritually, the Spirit of God working in me As I read the Word of God and I internalize what He's saying to me, the Spirit of God will change me permanently. He will take a selfish, focused person, focused only on their own needs, their own wants, their own desires, someone who has bought into the culture of more, bigger, and better, and change them into a person that is open and generous with their time and their talents and also their monies. You know, there's not a person watching this online today, there's nobody in this sanctuary that would identify themselves as Scrooge. Not a one of you. But there are many of us that are so bound by debt that we can't practice generosity. So what do we do? Financially, what you do is you begin to sacrifice your wants. So, for example, you forego a daily Starbucks You do that five days in a row, that's what, a couple hundred dollars? Okay. (laughs) It hadn't impacted your lifestyle a bit, but you are sacrificing to meet a need. Now, this isn't about the church. I've had people tell me in the past, listen, I give you my time, but there's a lot of wealthy people there. They'll make up the difference. It's not about the church. It's about you, and it's about your heart. And you need to engage financially and sacrifice what you want so that others can have needs met. It's ultimately about you. So here's a question. Ask yourself, am I truly content? Would I be described as a content individual? God can use your giftedness, and so you plan for it. You begin to work. If you're in debt... You seek to crawl out of debt. You get it, find your canceling if you need to. We'd love to help you at that point. As you give that Starbucks money, what you do is you pray. You ask God, you take these dollars and you do with them as you wish to your great glory. What are you doing? You're making giving a spiritual event. It's not a have to. You do it because you love the Lord and you're seeking his purposes in your life. You find ways to be generous to the people around you. You're open to those unexpected conversations. You spend your talents and you use them in ways. Now, some of you, it's easier to write a check than it is to give time. Okay, so let me say this. You're here, right? Okay, so no more time. Most of you are very happy, smiling people. Now, not all of you, but most of you are. Then serve as a greeter at a door. That's ministry. People are coming back. Be there to welcome them. Be a happy, smiling face. Does it cost you any time? And you're going to be the recipient of the blessing. You're going to be the recipient as you seek the Lord's purposes. So if contentment is the catalyst of generosity, number two, community is the context of giving. Community is the context of giving. Paul says, verse 13, I can do all things. Okay, That's a bridge to verses 14 through 18. So look there with me. Verse 14 through verse 18. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. I've received full payment and even more. I'm amply satisfied and supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you've sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Pleasing to God. So what is he saying here? Okay. First of all, he gives thanks. But he almost sounds a little ungrateful. He said, it was good of you to share, but I was okay. I was okay. So what's he saying? 
He's saying, no other churches gave me a gift. You know why? He wouldn't accept it. Paul was really concerned that people would think he was in the gospel for personal benefit. Really irked the people in Corinth. They wanted to give him a gift. He wouldn't take it. But there was a partnership with this church, and we don't understand all of it, but God has done something in their hearts and his lives, and Paul would accept. He said, when I was in Thessalonica, okay, go back to the first of this series. Paul has entered into Macedonia. He leaves Philippi. He goes right down the road, and there's Thessalonica. They hear he has need, so they send a gift to them. He says that you send a gift over and over again. Where is he now? Well, we know he's in Rome. He's under house arrest. He's awaiting trial. But he's also responsible for his own expenses. And here Philippi sends Epaphroditus. They send a financial gift. His needs are met. But what I want you to notice here is it's not about the money. It's about the partnership. It's about the fact that they supported him spiritually and emotionally. It made a difference. You know, as I was writing this message, I was here in the Reed building, and I looked out the window, and there were three ladies that I've known for many years. One of them, since the very first steps I walked on this campus, she greeted me. I've known these ladies to be just generous in every aspect of their life. They come to worship and they worship. They open scripture. They have served. One of them was one of my very key volunteers for the first years of my life at Park Cities. They've served all generations. They continue to serve. They have celebrated life together. And as I watched them out there, they were laughing. And I know that they've mourned and they've wept together. And as I watched them, my, my daughter would say I'm a creeper, number one, because I kept looking out at them just to see what was going to happen. I know they all tend to be long-winded, so I just wanted to see what was going to happen there. <laughs> they were having the best of times. But as I looked at them, you know what I thought? I thought there's nothing like the church. There's no place, place like the church in this world today. There's no place like the church where unity comes out of diversity. There's no place. There's no place like the church where multiple generations come around a common mission and purpose. There's no place like the church where people will forego their desires to meet the needs of others. There's no place like the church where people can exercise all of their giftedness. Think about the people who just led us in the choir. There's not a better choir in the state of Texas, which means the world, okay? Okay? They use their giftedness, what? To minister unto you. There's no place like that. There's no place where people will put aside their own joys to bear the burdens and the pain of others. My friends, there's no place like the church. And Paul is saying that this happens because of God's grace. You see that in verse 10 through 14 that we just read. I could synthesize that to one word, grace. And grace and contentment equal generosity. It's a new generosity. It's a generosity that is driven by the mission of God. You know, we end this series today, but next week our pastor is reminding us in the next series that we're better together. We're better together as a church. We're better as we come together, not around a singular worship style, not around a singular generation or focus, but we're better together as we come around mission. And our mission is the same mission as the mission that Philippian church had, the Great Commission. So he's going to be reminding us of our mission and how our values that have bubbled up over 82 years propel us to achieve the mission of making disciples. You need to be here these next three weeks. Now, back to our passage. Verse 17, Paul makes an interesting comment. He said, what I desire is that more be credited to your account. Now, when you read this at face value, what's it sound like? You're kind of working your way to heaven. He uses financial language here, and it's like there is a ledger, and you're able to check something off, and you just make one more step. That's not it. That would negate everything else in the New Testament. It would negate everything that Paul said. Remember Ephesians 2, 8, 9, he said it's by faith. It's by God's grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. But what he is saying to us is this. God knows. God knows. I'm looking at people that I have served with for many years. God knows the sacrifice of your time. There are people in this room that are sacrificing financially each and every week. God knows. The writer of Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10 says this. God is not unjust 
Listen to this. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help him. Men, women, friends, God knows. God knows your heart. He knows how you approach life. If you approach life like this, God knows. But God also knows when you open your hearts and your hands. Eugene Peterson renders this, that you have open hearts, open hands. And Paul tells us there's a threefold benefit. Number one, he tells us in verse 18, look back there with me, in verse 18, that God is pleased. He uses language there that would give the imagery of an Old Testament sacrifice. That as a sacrifice was burned, the smoke would waft up into the heavens and God would know and God would be pleased. He says right here, God knows and God is pleased. That's a blessing. Secondary blessing here is, Paul says in verse 16, the recipients are blessed. What does he say? You blessed me. You loved me. You supported me. You cared for me. When you exercise generosity, you're making a statement of grace. But verse 17 gives a surprise. You're the beneficiary. And maybe you get the greatest benefit because you get the joy. You get the joy. You know, I was thinking as I was driving in yesterday, I thought, I've been, I've been about pastoral ministry now for 42 years. That's, that's a long time. That's old. I ought to have more grandkids than the two I've got. I mean, that's old. But as I thought about it, I thought, you know, one of the things I've learned is that you're about as happy in church as you want to be. You're about as happy at Park City's Baptist Church or wherever your church family is that you want to be. You get about as much out of it as you put into it. And I don't mean any disrespect, but if you come in every now and then and you sit in a worship service and you go, and that's your sole engagement, number one, you are loved and valued in this church, and we're grateful for you. But you're not going to receive out of the blessing of Park City's Baptist Church all that's available to you because you're not engaging in all that's available to you. You're not engaging your heart and your passions and your mind. You're going to be about as happy here as you want. And what Paul is saying in new generosity, contentment comes from walking with Jesus, and he also says engaging in the community of faith, and in this case, that is the community of Park City's Baptist Church. You're blessed. You're blessed. So I wanted to take just a couple of moments, and I wanted to share. I wish I had an hour to do this. We're going to run through some slides, and I want to show you, for those of you that give through this church, I want you to see just a little bit of the fruit of what God has done in this last year. You know, if you come to our annual church conference in June, and let's be honest, most of you don't, but if you did, you would see all the ways that your budget giving is making a difference. One of the things that you would see is a page that shows our vetted ministry partners from the Missions Committee and the Baptist Partnerships Committee. You'd see all of these opportunities that we have to make a difference. We make a difference in lives right here in Dallas. We make a difference across the state through Texas Baptist and also our affiliation with other partners, and we do it across the world. You make a difference, a gospel, life-transforming difference. Back in the spring of 2019, we took up an offering for the seed company, and the seed company takes scriptures and translate it for people who don't have the scriptures in their own love language. Right here is a copy of the Gospel of Luke. There's a pamphlet in here from Luke chapter 24. They're still working, but it's coming. And there are people in South Asia that you're never going to meet. But people are going to hear the gospel because you cared. And you have the joy of being a part of that. That is life transforming. Eternity will be able to tell all that happened is because of your work there. You see here ministries that help the hungry and the hurting, and there's some photographs there of people during the great winter freeze. I talked about the gift cards that we've given, the ongoing gifts through South Texas. We sent 1,154 blankets along with other items just in the last week. Jack Lowe Elementary, a school that was at the bottom of the stack, is now recognized nationally, and the DISD and Jack Lowe Elementary have said Park Cities has been instrumental. All of the people, all of the time, and the dollars that have flowed in there have made a difference. 
There's a new minister in our next generation area called Off the Clock. It meets on Tuesday nights at the Angelica, and it is for very young adults who will never come here. Not right now. But they're going there to ask questions, serious life-challenging questions, and they're being answered with Scripture. Again, only eternity is going to tell the value of that ministry. You're making it happen. We have a new resident program here. You've been blessed by some of the residents as they come up. One of them, Caleb Rhodes, uh, preached a few weeks ago in the chapel. I heard he was wonderful. Do you know that is a heart gift from a family that had an extraordinary gift to make to this church? They met with the pastor and I, and they said, help us understand. We love bricks and mortar. We have benefited from it, but this isn't bricks and mortar. Help us. And they gave for this. And their desire is that other people would give for the resident program so that we can continue to do this. We can endow it. It can be an ongoing part of the ministries here. You did this. Espanol ministry, they had 12 professions of faith one night just a few weeks ago. They just had a marriage conference out of that ministry. We serve in our own fellowship. We had a picnic out on the lawn for our 82nd anniversary. We're serving our older adults. Back in August, I said, I need some men and women to volunteer to help us kick off a ministry to our widows, to our older adults who need household chores done. You volunteered, and we're starting it very soon. We have a great virtual retreat coming up for men and women over the age of 55. Guess what? February, you're making that happen. You know, I, I've told this story before, I'm not sure in here, but about a woman in India. They came to know Jesus. She said, I knew somebody was going to come. She had been healed. She had been healed in the name of Jesus, but she didn't know who he was. I walked up her road, very dusty, hot day with a translator. She trusted Christ. And she said, I knew somebody would come. I knew somebody would tell me who he is. She trusted Christ. And my friends, you have the joy in all of these. As you participate in the ministries of Park Cities, your heart ought to be beating a little bit faster. You ought to be smiling a little bit broader. You're a part of all of these and hundreds of things more. As you participate in the ministries and you give sacrificially to fund what God is doing here. Number three, Christ is the cause of our generosity. Christ is the cause, he's the initiator, he's the source, he's the catalyst. David Garland says this, the gospel is not about what we can get from God, but what God has given to us so that we might give of ourselves to others. Givers are made generous because of God's grace working on them, in them, and through them. Look with me in verse 19. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Let's break this down. And my God. You know, as Paul was writing this, he could have said, and may God. He said, my God. He was a recipient of the generosity of Jesus when he trusted Christ and left a murderous lifestyle to live as an apostle for the Lord. He was a recipient of grace as God time and time again had rescued him and put him back on solid ground. His God had used the Philippian church to meet needs that no one else was allowed to. No one else knew existed, but they did. And so he tells us today at Park City's Baptist Church, and may my God, look at the verse, he'll meet all your needs. You know, all is a little word, but it's got a big impact. Now, he doesn't say all your wants, all your desires, but out of his riches, he'll meet all your needs. Remember, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Guess what? He can take and, and give you a new perspective on life. He can give you a new generosity of life that helps you understand the difference between wants and needs. He said he'll meet all your needs. And look, number three, according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus the book of Colossians, Paul says that Jesus, that it was by him all things were created. He says that in Jesus he holds all things together. I have a picture in my mind of the Lord himself just scattering the stars across the heavens. And guess what Paul says? He cares for you. If you're watching online, if you're here in the sanctuary, God cares for you. And he desires to meet your needs. The New Living Translation puts it this way. I think it's kind of childlike. I like this. And this same God who takes care of me 
This God who takes care of me will take care of you. We're called to a new generosity of grace. A new way of looking at life and living out our lives. The totality of our being. All that we've been given and we use it to his glory. Back on August 12th when we began this series, I had the pleasure of being here and bringing it to you. Verse 2 in chapter 1 says this, grace and peace to you. Paul finishes the letter with these words in uh, verse 23 of chapter 4. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace to grace. We are called to live lives of active grace. To the glory of God, but remember, you are a recipient of the grace that you extend.